Meeting to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is request for bill introductions. Are there any bill introductions? Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, update on the federal uh, medical assistance percentage enhancement rate and eligibility. Uh, Kristen Osterland, Deputy Medicaid Operations Director, Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Uh, Kristen, Christine, welcome to committee. Good morning. Is that, there we go. That's better. Um, chairman, members of the committee, thank you for having me this morning. Uh, my name is Christine Osterland. I'm the De Deputy Chief Operating Officer for Kansas Medicaid at KDHE. Um, as we get started this morning, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the changes that the omnibus bill made to the federal participation rate, which is the amount of federal dollars we receive uh, for the Medicaid program, as well as some other changes it made re relative to the timeline when we can start uh, performing renewals, annual renewals on our Medicaid population. Um, so for those of you who may not be really familiar with Medicaid, just a tiny bit of background. Uh, Medicaid is operated as a state and federal partnership uh, between the state of Kansas and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services known as CMS. Um, the state must follow rules and guidelines um, established by CMS in the operation of the Medicaid program and any state laws or rules obviously as well. Um, and important to note that no state rule or law can be in conflict with a federal rule or law. Um, most costs for Medicaid are actually covered by the federal government. Um, outside of the public health emergency, um, our standard federal participation rate is about 60%. So the federal government pays 60% and we pay about 40%. So in late December, um, prior to the um, Omnibus Act, as we've been talking about when are we gonna start doing the reviews for our Medicaid population, uh, prior to the bill passing, um, the end of the public health emergency and the start of the annual reviews for Medicaid population, those were linked together. They were tied together. The omnibus bill delinks those. So now the starting of our annual reviews for our Medicaid population and therefore some folks no longer being eligible is actually a standalone item and that date was established as April 1st of 2023. Um, prior to the passing of the um, omnibus bill, um, the federal government was going to give us a 60-day notice uh, prior to us being able to start reviews. Fortunately, now we've actually got about a three-month window where we've been notified and can start to make our plans for the starting of the reviews. The other big provision of the omnibus bill, which is actually a win uh, for, the, for the state of Kansas as well as all other states, Prior to that bill, when CMS would have declared the end of the public health emergency, our increased federal funding would have ended in the quarter in which the PHE ended. And that's a lot of words. So essentially what that meant is if the public health emergency would have ended, for example, on January 11th, which was our previous date of 2023, all of our increased federal funding would have ended on March 31st, 2023. And a lot of people called that the cliff because we'd still have additional members enrolled, but we would have lost all of our increased funding. Um, we'll cover later in the presentation, but the omnibus bill actually gave us a step down of that increased funding. So it's a actual uh, benefit to the state of Kansas. If you go to the uh, next slide, if you have that in front of you, um, this kind of gives a chart of what the Omnibus Act did to this increased participation. Um, so first, the baseline, Kansas receives 59.76%. Um, that's just our standard federal participation rate that we receive, and that is for federal fiscal year 2023. Um, currently, um, due to the provisions that we're not able to remove folks from the rolls, uh, Kansas has been receiving an additional 6.2% from the federal government. So what happened with the omnibus bill is, and I'm comparing um, prior to the omnibus bill, what would have happened to that increased participation to now what is going to happen under omnibus. Um, so from January 1st to March 31st of this year, um, we will receive, continue to receive that 6.2% increase. Starting April 1 of this year, 
prior to omnibus, our increased amount would have gone to zero, nothing. And now it's going to be at 5% for second quarter of this calendar year. Um, as we move to the third quarter, uh, we do a step down from the 5% down to 2.5%. Um, but again, prior to omnibus, that amount would have been zero. And then the last quarter of this calendar year, we will still receive 1.5% of increased federal participation rates. So all in all, it's a, it's a win for the state of Kansas financially. Now we'll move a little bit into uh, the redetermination, the start of these annual reviews for the population um, and what changes were made uh, due to the Omnibus Act. Um, April 1st of this year is the first date that we can remove um, individuals from the Medicaid rolls, essentially the continuous eligibility requirements um, end and they can be terminated from the program. Um, we are still waiting. CMS has in, um, given us initial guidance on all these provisions and all the requirements in order to start the annual reviews. We still are waiting on some final guidance from them, which we are hoping will come this week or next week. Um, it's important to note that we must comply with all of the CMS guidelines um, around notifications as well as reporting requirements in order to continue to receive um, our full amount of FMAP, otherwise we would be at risk for penalties. And so that's why us receiving that federal guidance is, is very critical. Um, we will have 12 months um, from the date that we start issuing the reviews um, to complete the cycle. So we have 12, month, 12 months to get all the reviews initiated and 14 months to complete any cleanup and, and finish that entire process. The last slide is just really a look at where our enrollment numbers sit right now. Um, continuous eligibility, obviously, which came into being um, in 2020, uh, really prevented us from removing anybody from, from Medicaid eligibility except for under very small circumstances, death, moving out of the state, um, et cetera. So here's a look at, as we started the public health emergency, so February 2020, we had just shy of 406,000 Kansans enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP. And as of December 1st of 2022, that number had grown to 533,000 individuals that are currently covered by Medicaid or CHIP in the state of Kansas. Um, so um, sometime over the next few months, as we get this final guidance from CMS and, and get into compliance with all those reporting requirements, we will start the review process on those 533,000 individuals. And with that, I will stand for questions. Thank you, Christine. Um, so you're still thinking that 125,000 people probably come off? That's our, yeah, Chairman, yes, that's our best estimate that somewhere between 115 and 125,000 individuals, once we complete this review process, will likely not be eligible. So how long do you think it will take you to get through that many? I mean, that seems like uh, a lot of uh, overview there. Do you have extra staff for this? or? Yes, yes. So we've been, um, both the state of Kansas staff, we've been hiring eligibility workers. Um, and then as well as we contract with Conduent, um, who does some of the eligibility work for our uh, family and children's populations. They've been hiring addition, additional staff. So yes, we have been staffing up um, as best we can. But yes, you are correct. That's a lot of individuals to get through a review process in, in, in 12 months. But uh, again, we're staffing up to be able to meet that demand. And, and so where will the FMAP be then when we're back to normal, I guess. Is... We will be at 59.76% until September 30th of this year. So the baseline federal participation follows the federal fiscal year, which is October 1 to September 30th. So the 59.76% will stay until September 30th. If there is an adjustment, there's not always an adjustment. It would happen October 1, but we typically, in, in that base FMAP rate, it is extremely rare that you would see anything consequential one way or the other. I mean, there's, there's outliers, but it should remain very close to that amount, if not that amount. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Fagg. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. I was wondering uh, on the number of individuals that's enrolled, uh, and if you take the 405, let's say before, how does that compare with other states? You know, population of 2,000,009 versus 400,000. Has anybody ever looked at other states just to kind of get a feel of how many people we have on that? So for Kansas, is about one-fifth of our population. What makes it really hard to do state-to-state -state comparisons is um, every state's Medicaid program looks a little bit different. Um, you may, states may decide to cover optional eligibility groups. So Kansas may cover a group that, let's say Missouri doesn't, or you know, Iowa doesn't. Some states are expansion states. Um, so there's just so many factors that go into why a state's roles may be higher than in other states as far as if you look at it as percent of the population. Senator Petty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And maybe even we looked at our neighboring states since they've all have expansion now, it might even look even more different, the Medicaid expansion. Um, I, I, I guess, I don't know why, but has this piece about the uh, increased FMAP, has that just become available? Because it seems like we've been talking about this a long time, but suddenly now we're actually going to continue to get money mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, an additional amount of money. That's a big plus. Yeah, that's a huge plus, yes, because you're correct, Senator, that prior to the bill passing, essentially once we got the green light, if you will, to start doing the annual reviews, that same quarter they were going to end all of that increased funding. So we'd be carrying additional eligibles on our rolls and, and our funding would have gone back to this 59.76%. Um, so yes, this is a, is a financial gain for the states that we're gonna re continue to receive some increased federal dollars while we're going through this process. And um, have you been able to estimate what that um, additional federal increase, what that uh, financially sh shows up to be? So what we've done, because again, we're still waiting on some final guidance from CMS. So what's a challenge right now is being able to pick that exact date we can start the process because we have to first be in compliance with all their requirements. Um, but what we have looked at is, so reviews don't happen. Um, it's not 1 12th every month. That, that's not the way reviews happen. So if you look at starting in the April timeframe, April, May, and June are just the way Medicaid ebbs and flows are heavy, heavy reviews months. So if we start our reviews with April, for instance, April, May, and June, that represents about 48% of our overall Medicaid total. So we're going to almost just by following, you know, the, the batch every, we call it a reviews batch every month, we would actually be just shy of 50% would have received their notice uh, by the end of June of this year. So we'll do, once we get the guidance and we can say, yes, this is the date we're starting, we'll add the fiscal to that. But even just us looking at the numbers in and of itself, I think it's going to position Kansas in a positive way that we will, in some respects, be front loaded with, with numbers um, and obviously be able to get more folks through that cycle as we continue that step down in funding. So we'll, so by June, we're going to see, we could see quite an impact on if, you're, if your estimate is between 125,000 or 115 to 125,000, and it looks like about 50% are going to go through the review by June, uh, we'll, be, we'll have a a pretty good idea of what that number is going to look like. We'll have some idea. Um, nuances of Medicaid as always, because there has to be a nuance, right? Um, any member that goes through their review cycle and whether they didn't turn any information in or they returned partial information in and so we sent them a notice and said, you're no longer eligible for Medicaid, they get a period of time and it's 90 days to submit additional information. So what's gonna happen with the numbers is someone, could it look like they fell off the rolls because we sent them that denial notice, they find out, oh, I'm, I'm no longer eligible and maybe you know, they, they follow through with the process. And so after the fact, they could come back on the rolls. So what will happen is we're gonna see ebbs and flows in these numbers these first few months, so I would estimate 
uh, you know, again, we're continuing to look at it, but it'll probably be closer to August, July or August, when we kind of have a good understanding of how many, what percentage are actually falling off, you know, who's really going to stay on, because we have to allow all those time frames to happen. And you said you've brought on more staff, but, yes. but isn't, is it Condren? Mm -hmm. and they do, they are, they're who you contract all already for the reviews, is that correct? Yeah, reviews is a part of their scope of work. And so they're staffing up as, as well as KDHE um, is staffing up for the elderly and disabled in long-term care. So both of us are adding, you know, is, and, and we started this process. I guess the fortunate part of this unwinding starting, and then we always, you know, we're anticipating it was gonna happen sometime early of 2023. We started these efforts several months ago. So, you know, we're in a good spot as we look at where we wanted to be with staffing with how many we've, you know, gotten on board already. So I guess that was the benefit of all of this. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Senator Fagg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, early in your presentation, you talked about state law versus federal law, and we have to abide by federal law. Does the state have a lot of uh, layering of laws on top of the federal law? Uh, just wondering no, the or, federal law. We just follow federal law, and that's kind of what we do. We have some state laws, so we have a program, for instance, like Medican, uh, which is kind of a gap coverage. So there are some state laws, definitely, that we follow. I mean, predominantly, it's it's federal. Um, federal rules and regulations, but you know, we, Kansas has done some good things in the optional programs and, and services that we provide to our members that, that were done at the state level. Any other questions? Senator Alley. So the, the base eligibility requirements to get on the program really did not change. Um, what, what's changed is when we go through the reviews process, the uh, CMS has actually given the states um, what I would call some additional flexibilities. So to give you a good example, if, if you change your address, and I could go into the National Change of Address database and, and find that address, Previously, we weren't allowed to accept that. The member themselves would have to provide that information to us. And so one of the flexibilities we've been given is to be able to use that national change of address, um, which allows us, again, to get information out to the Medicaid member quicker. So really, any changes that were made due to the public health emergency were more on flexibilities as we get into the review process and being um, trying to make that easier for both the member as well as for the state in handling this, this volume. What we don't know is will those flexibilities continue once we get through this you know, one year cycle, but to be eligible, those rules um, didn't change as a result of this. They haven't changed, but it made it easier for you to do your checking for that. Is that what you're telling well, me? Well, we already had in place, um, we have a lot of electronic uh, matches that we do. So for instance, we use talks, which a lot of companies use when they're verifying employment. We'll use that to verify income. We have interfaces with the Social Security Administration. So there's a what we do is we try to do all that we can through automated processes and interfaces. And if we can get verification on you know household income, we'll use that to A, make it easier for us because we can do it quicker, obviously, if it's an immediate response, um, you know, versus having to send information to a member and wait for it to come back. But that's also a benefit to the member um, that, you know, we're being able to, in some respects, kind of do that for them. Um, now, there'll be verification, you know, that they'll have to provide, you know, if they disagree with what we found, you know, obviously they can supply supplemental information if they choose to. But yes, we do try to do it as automated as possible. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Christine, thank, thank you. you for being here today. Appreciate it. Next, we'll have a brief briefing by the staff on intellectual and developmental dis disability waiver modernization, and we'll have Dayton Lemonian Legislative Research. Dayton, welcome committee. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dayton Lemonian. I'm a fiscal analyst with KLRD. 
Uh, you should have a report in front of you that looks like this. It is the report of the uh, Special Committee on Intellectual and Developmental Disability Waiver Modernization to the legislature. We'll go ahead and turn to the or turn the page. You should see a page with a gray box that contains the recommendations. The Special Committee on IDD Waiver Modernization generally agreed the state should pursue a community supports waiver. Therefore, the committee recommends the KDADs provide a uh, fiscal impact statement for each service discussed by the committee for possible inclusion in the waiver. A $20,000 annual individual cap be placed on the waiver. <clears throat> the executive branch transition the Medicaid managed care system from an 1115 waiver to a 1915B waiver. The KDADs provide an estimate on the number of individuals who are likely to request self-determination. <clears throat> that um, KDHE and KDADs continue to study strength-based assessments, such as the CIS scale or the MIFI, as alternatives to the deficit-based basis tool for the HCBS IDD waiver. <clears throat> that the waiver include individual budget authority across all services and that KDHE and KDADs identify a process to prevent children from being removed from the autism waiver without notification. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dayton. Uh, questions? Senator Pittman. There's a, a lot to unpack here, obviously. Um, but just briefly, I feel like it may be easier for you to kind of explain the difference between the 115, 1115, the 1915B waiver. What, what's the significance of that? Uh, so that is actually separate from the home and community-based services waiver. That's the overall Medicaid waiver for the state. Um, unfortunately, I'm probably not the best person to address that, but we do have a representative from KDADS, Mandy Flower, as well as maybe some of the KDHE people may be able to address that. Yes. Please state your name. Good morning. I'm Mandy Flower, the Interim Commissioner of Long-Term Services and Supports at KDADS. And the difference between the waiver authorities, uh, the waiver authority that we're looking at for the community support waiver will give us uh, some freedom from that budget neutrality that affects us in some of the other waivers. Senator Pittman. Probably best if I uh, meet with you individually to understand that a little bit more, as well as some of these other things. It seems like there's a lot of recommendations here. Is the net impact of this to, what, what would you summarize as the net impact if we were to make all these changes? What would be the maybe top two benefits that we might be able to see from doing these? Okay, well, we'll still have the comprehensive waiver that we support right now. Uh, the community support waiver, we anticipate uh, families that are on the waiting list can utilize this waiver to get services that they need. Um, we also anticipate that some people on the current waiver that has a large menu of services might opt to go to this community supports waiver if they do not need um, the residential services, the day services. There's more of an em emphasis on employment, respite care, things like that, personal care. So we think in two instances we'll see less folks on the waiting list that can transfer over to this waiver and we'll also see people that have less intensive needs move from that comprehensive waiver to this community waiver so on this wait list i'm glad to hear that we're hopefully going to help uh, reduce that so, um, so you know at, at different uh, meetings uh, asked the question about identifying these children so we know what needs they even need. Are, are, are we moving in that direction at all? Currently, we're doing a waiting list study where we're looking at the needs of the children, adults that are on the waiting list, and trying to develop a plan moving forward on how we can support them. So are we still over 10,000 people? Um, currently, we have a little over 4,000 on the waiting list, and we have a little over 9,000 that are enrolled in receiving services on the comprehensive IDD waiver. Well, I'm really, really glad to hear that we're, we're identifying these children or adults in some cases that, you know, because many do not need the full 
meal deal. You know, some can uh, get service and, and be productive if we just, you know, get the needs that they, their particular needs. So. Absolutely. And when I, when I say children, I should clarify, we're looking at um, that teen age, that transition age, um, so we can help them with employment supports, help families with respite to give them a break from providing those services all day. Other questions? Senator Fagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in talking about the individual cap, we've never had a cap on that before. Um, well, this how did they decide the twenty thousand? Just might talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, the IDD waiver modernization chair capped it at twenty thousand. Um, this will help us have more participants on this waiver. I just wondered where the twenty come from. Was there just kind of a was there any, what was the thought process? Was got the committee was in discussion about different uh, caps, and the 20000 seemed to be right in the ballpark of what we could do. Yeah. Senator Petty. Uh, thank you. Um, on the last bullet about the KDHE and KDADS, uh, the process for preventing the children from being removed from the autism waiver, could you expand on that a little bit? Um, there were reports that people were being removed, their children were being removed from the autism waiver. So we're going to be working with KDHE to find a solution so we will not have children losing that waiver service. And do you know uh, what were some of the incidences that where they supposedly, where they were thought that they had been removed or were being removed? Um, I don't have that information with me, but I'd be glad to report that back. Any other questions? Senator Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the second time. Um, just real quick, it looks like there was some, some review of other states that inside of this task force, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, can you just summarize, or actually, I really want to specifically understand, are other states experiencing these kinds of same situations? Is it of the same magnitude and anything Anything that you can kind of expand on in a, in a minute or less? Sure. Um, yes, we did look at a variety of states, Tennessee. Um, they all talked about their waivers and their waiver authorities and how they're utilizing different waivers to meet the needs. We have looked at Oklahoma. They had an extensive comparable waiting list to ours, and they are in the process of eliminating that waiting list and they're doing it in phases. So we're looking at that approach for the community support waiver as well. Any other questions? Seeing none. Mandy, thank you a lot. We appreciate you being here and, and uh, filling in some uh, questions. Appreciate it. Next, we'll have an update on the mental health intervention team pilot project. John Calvert, director of Safe and Secure Schools Kansas State Department of Education. John, welcome committee. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to come today and, and update you on our mental health intervention team program. Uh, my name is John Calvert. I'm the director of the Safe and Secure Schools Unit at the Kansas State Department of Education. Uh, first, what I want to do is just kind of try and provide a brief overview of the program. Um, the mental health intervention team program focuses on K through 12 students. Uh, and identifies these students and, and helps the families navigate that mental health services uh, by linking them with uh, already existing statewide uh, community mental health centers uh, and the resources that we, we can obtain. And we do that through a liaison uh, that is employed by the school district. Uh, we also focus on foster care students as that is what we were tasked to kind of keep track of, uh, knowing that foster care students are, are highly transient and, and are a lot of times in need of mental health services as well. Uh, and what it's done uh, over the last five years is it's really helped break down the barriers that have been unintentionally put in place for our kiddos to receive mental health services, such as mom or dad or guardian has to take time off work, gas money to drive the 30 to 45 minutes to get to a community mental health center. This is actually bringing the services, the therapy, the case management inside of the school 
so that those barriers have been eliminated. Um, this bill was championed back in 2017, 2018 by Representative Landwehr, uh, and she has been a fantastic support of this. Uh, we monitor four different things uh, with our program. We monitor academics, change in attendance, uh, internalizing and externalizing behavior. Uh, as I stated earlier, the liaisons truly are the bridge. They are connecting the school and the student and the family and the community mental health services all in one. Uh, and that's so important because if you've ever tried to navigate this by yourself as, as what I felt like was an educated adult, it was daunting for me to look at the things that, that our students and that our parents were having to, to go through. Uh, so to have that person that can help the schools and, and uh, the school staff feel comfortable going to and identifying students that, that could possibly need these services. Um, the communication is done between uh, the mental health professional and the school. Uh, is permitted because they've signed a memorandum of understanding to under, to, so that everybody's on the same page so that they can communicate back and forth and better help our kids as well. Um, it started in 2018, 2019 school year. We started with nine pilot school districts. Uh, I do want to point out that two of the three, I'm sorry, three of the nine um, are the largest districts in the state uh, with KCK, Topeka and Wichita in those nine pilots. Uh, and we started uh, with 45 liaisons. We served 212 foster care students the first year. And the total number of students served was 1,708. This school year in the 22-2023 school year, we have 67 districts participating in the program. We have about 150 liaisons, and we just had a progress report that was due on December 20th of 2022. And so in that first semester of school alone, we have served 4,801 students, and 447 of those were foster care students that were served. Uh, we were tasked to partner uh, with an outside agency to do an effectiveness study this year. We partnered with Wichita State uh, University. They conducted their study and their findings uh, said pretty much what we knew and, and thought that they were gonna say. Um, they were unable to give any kind of individual student data. Uh, we were unable to give them the individual student data, so they could not necessarily adequately go through and uh, demonstrate the effectiveness. However, what was constant in their report over and over again was that the team members constantly responded to this, uh, that they saw a reduction in the stigma of mental health services, which is so, so important. The stigma that has been there for years, they're seeing a reduction in that in the schools that have this program. Students are fighting for their, for their own mental health. They are determined to help their friends when they see their friends need mental health services. They are, they are becoming uh, the front runners in that. Um, they're seeing improvement in the outcomes of students, the better coordination for care, and improved communication, which I think is so, so vital when we start talking about our kids. Everybody needs to be on the same page. Their conclusion paragraph that I copied and pasted here in this next slide, I'll just hit a couple of points. Again, over and over, a reduction in the stigma in the mental health services. And one of the things that I can't brag on our liaisons enough, this study showed that we have the right people in the liaison position. The dedication and commitment of the liaisons and the mental health staff involved in the program was evident throughout the process. The extraordinary, extraordinarily, I'm sorry, extraordinarily strong response to the surveys, the high rate of response is also an indication of the perceived impact of the program. This program is working, it's doing fantastic things, and I'm so excited to be a part of it. Uh, if you ever need a feel-good story or need a good cry moment, call me, please. I will put you in contact with our liaisons. They have some fantastic success stories, and I copied just a couple of bullet points here for you. We're seeing staff buy into the program. Not only once this program gets into a school, once it's been there for a few years, the, the school staff says, hey, I'm observing these behaviors and not only am I worried about you, but I know the right person to go to and I feel comfortable referring you to our liaison so that you may be able to qualify for this program and start getting the mental health services you need. Uh, we're seeing that having in-person therapy inside of the school is doing, I'm sorry, is doing wonders. Uh, it's helping our foster care students. 
uh, walk through this process of, of being adopted or going through the foster care system. It's giving them an outlet to talk to and, and see that their, their feelings, their behaviors, what they're going through is, is okay. And it's guaranteed help for our kids that may not be able to get help otherwise because of those unintentional barriers of taking time off work or school, the gas, and going through uh, and driving the 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes one way. The last slide I wanted to highlight in and of itself, and it's why this $10.3 million program uh, I will continue to fight for, I will continue to see and fight for expansion. From a high school student, my therapist saved my life. When we look at the statistics that are going through in this country, not only the state, but this country, the mental health crisis is, is imminent. Uh, and so if we take a look at the 48,000 students and think that just 2% two of, two of them were, were contemplating suicide, just 2% of that 4,800, and we can get in there and provide the services to stop that, we're saving lives with this program, and it's doing fantastic things around our state. And I appreciate the time uh, and the opportunity, again, to provide you this update. And at that, uh, with that, I will stand for questions. Thank you, John. Uh, great report. Thank you, Chair. I, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that uh, when, when we see success stories like this, something we all can be proud of that we were part of trying to get a change that's making a difference in these kids' lives. And uh, particularly your foster numbers here. I'm really pleased to see that. So, Senator McGinn. Thank you. Um, I was just curious, your title is Director of Safe and Secure Schools Unit. Is that yes. your title? Yes, ma'am. So do you deal with the, I don't know if we, seems like we throw $5 million in every year for guns and gun control, I shouldn't say gun control, we're in Kansas. Um, but that um, things that the schools can do to be safe. Are you in charge of that as well? The $5 million school safety grant? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was just curious. And then um, the, the concern I've always had about this program, and I see it is growing a little, is, you know, we're picking, we're picking schools who get this program rather than um, that they may want it and they don't get it. So every district that applies for the grant so far has been able to to get into this grant and, and receive the funds for this grant. So it's not that I go out or my team goes out and picks and choose schools. The schools actually come in and apply. Um, the, the hardship for that, I'll be completely honest with you, is being in the appropriations bill, we wait for it to get signed in May. The, uh, those applications are due usually in June so that we can then turn it around, organize everything, and then send it to our State Board of Education for their approval. And so it's a very, very quick application process. We're seeing um, a, a difficult time in hiring liaisons for a one-year guaranteed position. Uh, being in the appropriations bill and having to be every year, that's the hard part. But up until this moment, um, and the, I saw the governor uh, also and her budget wanted to expand this by $3 million. I think that's a great rate. We're not overwhelming our schools. We're not overwhelming our, our community mental health centers at that point. But at this point, every school district that has applied to participate in this grant has been funded. Okay, that's good to know. I know that when we first started, we just picked certain ones, and then I think we expanded it a little, little bit. But now to hear that any school that wants to participate has the opportunity. Yes, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I couldn't concur with your uh, your statements anymore. I think it's a fantastic program and it is a great report. Two things. Um, it's disappointing that the Wichita State couldn't get better statistics and metrics, um, you know, with a baseline maybe even of surveys of what your attitudes are in terms of the student populations on mental health, these types of things, or some other things. And I understand mental health is a hard area to get metrics around, but it seems like, you know, we could do better in terms, I mean, those are great, the enthusiasm and those types of things in the survey. Anecdotal evidence is always nice, but getting some metrics that are showing statistical improvements, I mean, I'd encourage uh, to continue along those lines to continue to show the impact of this program that's obviously having a great benefit. The second thing is I was wondering, you know, when we talk about, 
the focus of the, the unit is on identifying students and helping families. You know, there's a lot of tension across the state, across um, opt-in versus opt-out surveys, where schools are, you know, now having to look at opting into surveys. And so it can be a more of a challenge, uh, understanding parental rights and that type of thing. Um, you know, one of the things that I know of our local schools that I talk to, they're disappointed that they can't necessarily identify the quiet ones that are having real big mental health issues. So I was wondering, you know, are you using surveys? Are they using surveys? Or is it typically an opt-in service from the students themselves that help them identify these kids that might be going through some, some challenges? Absolutely. So to answer both your questions, we can't we don't track student level data, we don't get student level data, and we won't give student level data because of um, the, the Student Data Privacy Act here, that state law, and then FERPA, that federal law, um, the, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. So it's just something we can't do. What we have done uh, is we are putting together for better terms as a think tank uh, this summer. We're going to call in a lot of our liaisons, our community mental health centers, our therapists, and, and truly, how can we better track this kind of, uh, of data? Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, to come up with something that, that can be a little more uh, uh, better, that I can come in and say, hey, here you go. Um, the, the second question as far as identifying kids, uh, the staff, our staff and our schools do a fantastic job. Uh, it's not necessarily by surveys, um, because again, 2567 gives us a lot of a lot of things that we have to go through with that. Um, but the staff will identify the kids one way or another. Maybe it's their actions. Maybe something's going on. Maybe they've been clued into something that's going on in their life. Uh, they'll talk to the liaison. The liaison again brings that kiddo in, brings the families in, and says, "We we have a program here that can offer services and offer help," and walks through them and gets them connected to a therapist. Thank you, sir. Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the concerns I've had with this program is um, that the, my understanding is you have liaisons in school that identify the students. And if there is a student identified, then they're called, we call in the community health. Is that correct? Correct. And then the community health are the ones that deal with the students. Are the liaisons uh, with them when they do that? They, they absolutely can be. That would be up to the discretion of the student and the families. Um, when we talk about making a case plan, we, we want to have that liaison in the room so that they can help organize that case plan with the school schedule and help explain that. But when it's therapy sessions or group sessions, a lot of times those, those liaisons are not in the room when that happens. That's a one-on-one -on -one with the therapist. One-on-one -on -one with them, which is fine. Um, during summer, <laughs> are the liaisons, are they keeping track with the kids? Are they communicating with the kids? Or is the community mental health? What, I mean, what if the children have a, uh, a need during that summer program? How does that work? Absolutely. So that's right now that's up to each individual district on how they want to work that. Uh, we do see a drop off in the summertime, mainly because it, it's summer and there's travel and there's other things going on. Uh, our, our goal is to make this a year long through the summer process so that you're absolutely right. If a student needs something, they have that liaison or their therapist. Um, but that therapist is there all year long. Um, and so our hope is that they've built that relationship with the therapist uh, and that community mental health center so that in the summer, the parent goes, you know, it, it might be a really good time for you to talk to your therapist again, or we want to continue these services. It might be at that time that they have to go to the community mental health center. A lot of times um, our schools will actually open their doors and say, hey, you can have this office right here if you want to continue to have your therapist meetings right here. But that would, that, that would be left up to the, each individual school district. The, uh, the district that lays on, are they, do they, are they available during the summer? Again, that, that's up to each individual district, whether they're the liaisons on a nine month or a 12 month contract. Um, I, I can tell you that a lot of our liaisons are available 24, that 12 month contract, yes. Uh, uh, and, that, and then of course, mental health is 12 months, they're, yeah, they're there anytime. But I think it'd be very important for that child to have a, someone to call they had an issue during the summertime or after 3.30 when school's not in trouble. Well, and that's the great thing about having that community mental health center. It's 24-7 care. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, John. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate it.
Uh, next, we'll have an update on the virtual math education program. John Hess, Director of Fiscal Services and Operations from the Kansas State Department of Education. John, welcome committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, um, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the RFP for the virtual math education program. In my role at the department, I serve as KSDE's chief procurement officer and primary point of contact with the Office of Procurement and Contracts. So uh, 2022 House Bill 2567 required KSDE to enter into a two-year contract for the implementation of a virtual math, math education program. Um, all school districts were authorized to use the program and KSDE is required to recommend the use of the program. To fund it, uh, KSDE received in fiscal year 2023 a $4 million allocation from the State Fiscal Recovery Fund from ARPA and, a two and for fiscal year 24, a $2 million appropriation from the State General Fund. Uh, it also requires a submission of a summary report on the program to the chairs of the House K-12 Education Budget Committee and the Senate Committee on Education. Um, on my written testimony, you can see some of the, requir the requirements that were put into House Bill 2567 for the program. Um, I won't read through them because it's just boring uh, for this purpose. Um, for, uh, so it was the intention of KSDE to enter into a, uh, the required two-year contract in time for the program to be implemented for the 2022-2023 school year. Unfortunately, the RFP process took significantly longer than anticipated, and um, it was not in place by the start of the fall semester. Um, the chairs of both uh, the House K-12 Budget Committee and the Senate Education Committee were informed of this, um, early, late summer, early fall of 2022. Um, and because of that, we don't have any data to report on the program because the program isn't in place yet. Um, you can see on the second page of my testimony a little bit of the timeline for that. Um, sometimes, in my, you know, through my experience working on RFPs at KSDE, sometimes they just take longer because there's a lot of moving parts and people involved in the process. Um, KSD is currently, uh, through the Procurement Negotiating Committee, currently negotiating a contract for this program, and we hope to have it in place within the next couple of weeks. So with that going, there will be still be time for uh, Kansas, a small window for uh, Kansas students to use the program before the state assessment window starts in the spring, but also then um, We'll also allow time for the scheduling of professional development activities for the provided by the vendor um, at for different school districts um, and schools that they can schedule those. And so it will be fully in place for next school year. Um, as a result, KSD doesn't we don't anticipate using the full amount of the four million state uh, four million dollar allocation from the state fiscal recovery funds. So pursuant to our our signed memorandum uh, MOA with the recovery office on the use of those funds, those will be returned af after the end of the fiscal year if they're not all used. Um, besides that, uh, I'm thank you for your time today and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, John. Senator Petty. State Board was so lucky to steal you away from us, John. <laughs> um, it's nice to see you. I I'm just trying to remember this legislation. So, um, in the end, it did come down to a program and not that school districts could continue doing what they might already have been doing virtually. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator, no, there is school districts are not required to use the program that the agency will enter into a contract with. KSD is required to recommend the use of the program. They're allowed, if they're using a different program than whatever vendor KSD selects, the school districts are still allowed to use their vendor. They just have to report data on this, the same kind of data that we're supposed to report. They have to report on how that other entity, that other third party uh, is to report like, you know, what it is, how many students are using it, how, what math test score, uh, state assessment scores are doing, that type of thing. So since we won't have, um, or we will just have completed the con, or have a contract in place with a vendor um, towards the end of the school year, but you will have the 
be receiving the report information from those school districts that are complying to these guidelines and doing something else? Uh, I believe so. I can double check and can, can I, it is our intention, I believe it is our intention to do so, yes. I, I need to double check with the appropriate people who collect that data, but yes, I believe, I believe so. I'd appreciate to know that. Thank you. Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here today. The uh, concern, I think, with the delay is these funds, the $4 million ARPA funds, uh, that's one-time money. Uh, what happens next year? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator, we have a, uh, that, that was the, the, our use of ARPA funds and the fact that it's one-time money was anticipated. And so 2567 included a $2 million appropriation in fiscal year 24, kind of, kind of jumped the gun about a year early for the fiscal year 24 appropriations. Um, but that was appropriated to support the contract in starting the fiscal year 24. And as long as the legislature deems it necessary and the governor wants to keep recommending it and the legislature approving it, that from fiscal year 24 onward. Uh, my question is that he had six million appropriated last year. Is that right? To four, two million from SGF and the and four million from special funds. Uh, are we gonna require another four million somewhere else or what? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator, no. So we only had four million dollars, just the state fiscal recovery funds in fiscal year twenty-three. So just four million this year. And I and I apologize if I did not, did not, uh, if my testimony was unclear on that. It was four million in state fiscal recovery funds this year. Then it was known those funds would go away for fiscal or okay. for fiscal year twenty-four, and so they were replaced with two million dollars in state general fund. My apologies, I didn't see the twenty-four. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, John. Appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee, I got a couple of announcements. Um, our subcommittees will be starting next week and uh, you will be receiving a spreadsheet with the dates for the hearings and the deliberations. And uh, we do start Wednesday and then we have deliberations on Friday. So we will have a committee meeting next week, Friday, uh, so you can put, put that on your schedule. And uh, Donna will get a hold of your, she'll come to your office and have you uh, um, deliver these uh, spreadsheets and would, would like to have you sign them. So any questions? Senator Petty. Just so I am clear, so you're saying we are going to meet on February the, I think that's the third. Yes. And we will have some deliberations ready for February the 3rd? We will. You know best, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Senator McGinn. I just, maybe everybody already knows this, but we have two new little baby waymasters. <laughs> Uh, I received the same text. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to announce it, so I didn't say anything, but yes, congratulations to uh, Crystal and Troy. They have uh, twin boys uh, born this morning, and so, and they look really like yeah. big boys for <laughs> twins. So, no other uh, business. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.